This video has been created as a final project for the Florida Master Naturalist Program's Freshwater Module. Kevin and I set out to explore Southwest Florida's marsh habitats. As we make our way inland, the impact of human disturbance upon the landscape is recognizable. Man-made canals have interrupted the natural flow of water to make way for the construction of homes and businesses. Rivers have been dredged and rerouted. Highways stretch across the landscape, blocking wildlife corridors and leading to the fragmentation of plant and animal communities. Improperly managed infrastructure and irresponsible agricultural practices have contributed to toxic algae blooms and other water quality issues. Recognizing the need for these wild places, community developers have begun working with conservationists to set aside areas for preservation and to mitigate some of the damage that has been done. This in turn has led to increased recreational and educational opportunities for nature enthusiasts. Southwest Florida's marsh wetlands are formed by the topography of the landscape and dominated by herbaceous plants such as grasses, sedges, rushes, and forbs. These plants biologically filter water as it makes its way into our aquifer, lakes, and rivers. Fire helps to maintain these areas by keeping more woody plant species from taking over. Transition areas occur where the water depth changes in what is often referred to as an ecotone. Okay, so one thing we know about this area that we're in is it used to be covered in Malaluca. And Malaluca is an invasive tree that was brought in around the uh, early 1900s. And they used it to dry up low-lying wetland areas that they wanted to develop. The problem is it became very invasive. It grows in very thick, dense strands, displacing the, uh, the uh, native species, uh, plant species that we have here. Those plant species are very important to the wildlife. And obviously they've cleaned this area out and it's allowed those plants to start coming back. You can get a real good sense of the topography of the land just by looking at the different types of vegetations that are out here. You can see way off in the distance the pine trees and the oaks and the different things out there. We have a pretty good idea that that area is going to be higher than the elevation right here where I'm standing. And we're talking about, you know, it could be just a matter of inches, but as you come across the marsh and you got this lower depression where water would settle during the wet season over here we got a great example of a of a um, cypress strand and so we know that the elevation over there is going to be lower than the elevation right here where i'm standing another thing that i'd like to mention is that where the taller trees are is actually going to be the deepest part of that strand so you can see as you come out where the trees are shorter, you know, it's not going to be as um, wet in that area during the dry part of the season. Oh, and I noticed right here we have a pond cypress. The cypress is a conifer, and when we think of conifers, you think of evergreens, but these trees are actually deciduous. They'll drop their leaves and their cones in the fall. Now, the, the cones and the seeds, when they drop, they'll take about one to three months to germinate. And if it's covered in water, they won't germinate, um, but they can remain viable for up to uh, 30 months. The trunk will get wider down at the base, which helps give the support or anchor it in the, uh, in the moist soil. When you first come upon one of these large wet prairie areas, it's easy to just dismiss it as an area of overgrown grasses and weeds. But upon closer inspection, you realize there's a large diversity of native grasses, sedges, rushes, herbs, and wildflowers. This area is just teeming with life. This plant here is Gulf Coast spikegrass. It's actually a sedge, but it doesn't have any leaves, but it has this sheath that runs along the stem at the base. 
and then it gets this spikelet at the top that has like little scales on it and from there grow little flowers there can be like 50 to 90 flowers on each little spikelet It grows from a rhizome. It can cover a dense area, which I think is really pretty, especially when the wind crosses them. Here we have mooly grass. You get these beautiful purplish inflorescence. It has wire-like stems and is an important seed source for wildlife. And the indigenous peoples used to use the seeds to ground into flour. And also they would use the stems to make brooms and brushes, things like that. It grows in clumps and can create this purple-like haze over an area that is pretty spectacular. And this flower is our state wildflower. The Pixie Coryopsis. We see these growing a lot in areas like this. This is maiden cane. It's a reed like grass. It gets these long seed spikes, and the seeds are eaten by waterfowl. The leaves come out directly from the stem at about 90 degrees and the young shoots are often eaten by deer. Maiden cane makes good nesting habitat for wildlife. This is a good example of why fire is so important to these wetland habitats. This is wax myrtle. It's considered a successional species in that it can form dense thickets that take over an area. When you crush the leaves, it has a scent of bayberry and is used for candle making and soap making. Uh, the berries are an important food source, let me see if I can find some, for birds providing energy, and it's the larval food host for the red banded hair streaked butterfly. Dahoon holly is another shrub that we oftentimes will find growing in these areas. Here you can see it right next to cattails. And behind that, even, are alligator flag and other aquatic plants. This shrub can often be found growing in transitional edges along cypress domes or in cypress strands. It's an attractive species. It spreads by new offshoots because the seeds, well, the seeds can take almost two to three years to germinate. Uh, the berries are popular with birds and they are on the female plant. This is a plant that's dioecious and you need both a female and a male plant and it's pollinated by bees. These ecologically sensitive areas are home for many wildlife species birds, reptiles, insects, crustaceans, mollusks, amphibians, and mammals all become part of a food web in which, whether predator or prey, each has a role to play in this diverse habitat. This is the show of an apple snail. There are uh, non-native apple snails and native apple snails. And I believe this one is a non-native apple snail. 
You can find these everywhere when you're walking around in the marsh areas. They're just laying around. And I'm guessing something probably ate it, is why there's not in there anymore. And if you look over here, you'll see one of the egg clutches. And this is an egg clutch of a non-native apple snail. The non-natives can lay as many as 2,000 eggs in a clutch. Whereas the native apple snail will lay as many as 10 to 80 eggs in a clutch. So, apple snails provide food for limpkins. If you're ever walking through a marsh area or a place where these apple snails are uh, plentiful, you'll see a pile of empty apple snails kind of all in one spot. Probably a limpkin, limpkin's been sitting there eating uh, apple snails. Another uh, bird that feeds on the apple snail is the snail kite. And 99% of the snail kite's diet is the Florida apple snail. But they uh, since have been known to start feeding on the uh, non-native apple snail, which has actually kind of brought their numbers back a little bit and helped them. One of the reasons we started losing the native apple snail is because of the um, draining of the Everglades and the depletion of the, uh, of the wetlands. Um, and when that occurred, also the snail kite uh, diminished. But now that the non-native apple snail has come in, um, their numbers are kind of increasing a little bit. So maybe that's a good thing. This plant here is called alligator flag. You can tell it gets its name from the shape of the leaves, which I guess they're supposed to be flag shaped. They're kind of lanceolate leaves. And they have these flower spikes on them that are a la light lavender purple color. I have a better picture I can show you of those when they're not quite as wilted. Uh, they produce a seed, and the birds really like those. Uh, it's also the larval host plant of the Brazilian skipper butterfly. Whenever you see alligator flag like this, it's usually when the water starts to get a little deeper, and you can tell from this area here that it is getting deeper. Uh, Another plant you'll see a lot of times in these areas is pickerel weed. I see some over here. It's not a very good example of it. It has the flowers faded, but that's pickerel weed right here. You can see they get these purple flower spikes on them. They're actually really beautiful. And the Brazilian skipper butterfly likes those as well. You can see all the water lilies. Now when this area starts to dry out, you'll see these are just kind of flattened on the ground and they'll, they'll stay there. They'll come back up. I wanted to show you this plant. It's called Bacopa. It is a perennial native herb. It has succulent leaves. And it's believed to be a brain tonic uh, and said to help with memory. Um, it's edible. You can put it in salads. Uh, it has a bitter flavor. I've tried it and it's all right. It has a nice texture. Um, sometimes people call it water hyssop, herb of grace. Oh, Bacopa is also the larval host plant for the white peacock butterfly. And we kind of have a, a uh, salad growing here because over there I see pennywort, which is also edible. It has a nice flavor, I think, texture. I've put it in salads before. You want to be careful, of course, wherever you harvest water 
plants and of course you don't ever want to harvest in a place like this where it's a preserve. As the rainy season ends and the waters begin to recede, new plants come in and old growth dies. Crawdads begin to make their burrows and small fish exhaust their efforts for survival as the detritivores begin their work turning detritus into nutrients. By visiting these wild places and becoming witness to their splendor, we gain a more profound appreciation for the natural resources that we share. We also come to recognize the human impact on these communities and then to ask ourselves, how can we do better? And even more importantly, what is at stake if we do not?